These are the stories. My little girl, she's changing lives just by being herself. Of organizations and people making a difference. When you first tell someone about adaptive wheelchair boxing, it doesn't sound real. And empowering others. It saved my life. It saved my life. Across Canada. I scored my first goal in my first blind hockey game. In our community. Shane has had a profound impact on all of us. He has a remarkable past and he is an incredible young man who has overcome so much. Shane's self-advocacy really brought to light a lot of things that were barriers for many students across the campus. Because he's such a strong self-advocate, he has done an enormous service for other students here at the college who may never meet him, but his impact has been significant. When Shane Baker enrolled in Camosun College in 2017, he could not have known the lasting impact he would make. As he began to navigate student life as a visually impaired person, he quickly realized the many aspects of the college experience that could be vastly improved, not only for him, but for countless others. To understand Shane's journey as an activist and changemaker, we need to start with his personal journey. Just outside the Wilnot Thomas Cultural Center and the welcoming totem that stands tall before it, Shane shares an indigenous art piece that he had personally commissioned to represent his culture and experience. The intertwining artwork of a bear, salmon, wolf, and eagle each play a part in Shane's story. My traditional name is Willow. I come from the Wil Wilp Gunanip, which is part of the Wolf Clan. I'd been thinking about this idea of getting a painting done, and I wanted it to tell some of the story of who I was and, and where I've been. In our stories, we have a bear, and so I wanted the grizzly bear to kind of represent, um, you know, a little bit of my story. Um, when I was involved in an accident in, in 2003, it was probably one of the most difficult uh, things that I've gone through and I found a lot of strength in my culture, and so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get this done, just to kind of um, commemorate some of the healing that I'd done. This picture here just reminds me to always know who I am and where I come from, and to also always give back to the community around me. Outside her residence in Victoria, BC, Shane's mother, Edith, reflects on how strong family and cultural roots have played an important role in Shane's life. Uh, my name is Nux Gus, and my English name is Edith Loreen Kuhanga. And uh, this afternoon, I'm being interviewed at Beckwith Park, which is right in behind our house. We come from a very large family, and the minute uh, a child is born, they're born into a house group. We call them wolf wolves. So that's the identity and the pride that they carry as a young child. So Shane, he was really proud of his culture. Inside their house, Edith and her husband Julius look over a collection of Shane's childhood photos, images of a child still years away from losing his sight. All the pictures of Shane that I gathered up from all of the albums and stuff. This is when he broke his arm. Look at, I think that he must have been only seven, so that would have been in 1984. Oh, this one is uh, with his rugby team. Oh, yeah. When high he school. Was, this was high school. Always, always happy kid. He was always smiling. He could be very mischievous, always up to something. So Shane was a really smart kid. When we moved to Victoria, he wasn't really um, encouraged as a, as a young First Nations boy who was so smart. It was as if the education system kind of stifled him a bit. And then when he got into high school, he got really into sports. When I was in high school, I really started getting drawn to rugby and I just devoted my whole life to it. And that kind of paid off uh, with uh, one of the men's league teams wanting to uh, bring me onto their team. And so uh, when I was about 18, I started playing uh, men's rugby for the Peninsula Old Boys. While playing for the men's league, Shane pursued a career in graphic design, but at the age of 26, an unexpected event would turn his entire life upside down. In 2003, um, I was involved in an accident uh, that left me uh, legally blind um, and a severe traumatic brain injury. My blindness was a result of uh, my optic nerves getting damaged. Um, I had to start over. Our community will return after the break. 
We now return to our community. Outside Shane's apartment near the harbors of Victoria, BC, Shane shares how his path to recovery led him to working with indigenous youth and eventually back to school. Uh, once I got through my, my recovery and, and started to get some, uh, some care, I started reconnecting with my, with my culture again and I started getting involved in indigenous youth conferences. First, it was just as a volunteer, and uh, one of the elders started seeing me interact with the youth uh, a couple of years, and she decided to uh, approach me and ask me if I ever considered uh, working with, with youth. And I decided to go for it, so I, I developed uh, some workshops and started getting my name out into the communities. And soon I was leading workshops that would be done in a sharing circle format with Indigenous youth. We would talk about all kinds of issues from addiction mental health, identity, things that our, our Indigenous youth were, were having challenges with. And I would just let them know that when we come together in a sharing circle, it's um, no, no person's opinion is more important than the others, and everyone has something to contribute. To help with the sharing circles, Shane brings a special item made of devil's club and an eagle feather. He carries it with him today and explains its significance. I was having a tough time and my, my Auntie Lillian um, brought me home. She, she realized that I needed to be home with family and friends and I'd really just started trying to re-engage with my culture and find some strength with it. So I was, had a lot of curiosity about some of our traditional medicines and this is actually what we call um, ooms or Devil's Club. It's a really special item that I, that I find a lot of strength with. My partner gave me this, this eagle feather that she had, and so now whenever I go for speaking engagements, it's, I, I bring this and it's, it gives an opportunity to tell a little bit uh, about where it came from and what it is. You know, I really wanted to show these uh, kids that Indigenous people aren't in the past. I did that for a few years, but my health started to uh, get negative, negatively impacted because of the severity of the traumatic brain injury that I sustained. I started developing a seizure disorder, and this forced me to uh, regroup and really um, start focusing some attention on my own self-care. Uh, it took me a few years to, to get back um, into speaking engagements and working with our youth. After that, I realized that um, I really needed to go to school. And so in 2017, I applied to the Indigenous Studies Diploma Program and was accepted. So I started in September 2017. <laughs> Shane's girlfriend, Dana, has arrived outside his apartment to drive him to Camosun College campus. Once on the campus, Shane leads us to the school's indigenous gathering place. Shane says the impressive round wooden building was an important place for him during times of struggle, and that his first few months at Camosun proved more difficult than he had ever imagined. When I first returned to Camos, and one of the biggest challenges that I faced was just stimulation. And so I remember the first week of school, the center of the campus was lined with student society vendors and booths and music was playing. And for somebody who was legally blind and was still adjusting to, to being a visually impaired person in such a, um, you know, so, so many noises and so many sounds, it was, it was really overwhelming for me. And I, I remember one day, um, I was walking uh, from my class and I was trying to get um, towards the library and I, I ended up lost. And I remember just like thinking, what am I doing here? Uh, this place isn't built for somebody who's visually impaired. Fortunately, I, I reached out to some friends uh, who were also in the program and uh, we kind of developed a bit of a buddy system. And so for the first few weeks, my cohort uh, for people that I had met would, uh, would bring me to my class. Some of them would walk me around the campus just so I'd start to get a little bit familiar. Um, and things just kept starting to build up. I was dealing with not having all of my course materials given to me in an accessible format. I reached out to the president of the college and I basically said I need some support. I need you, you people to help me do better at this college. Sherry Bell says her first meeting with Shane Baker was unforgettable. 
Hi, my name is Sherry Bell, and I'm president of Camosun College in Victoria, British Columbia. I'm standing in my office at our Lansdowne campus. Shane reached out to me when he was attending Camosun, and he said he wanted to get together and just share a story with me. So he did. He came to my office, and we probably spent well over an hour together. I learned about his accident, I learned about his past, and then we talked about his experience at Camosun and some of the barriers that he was facing and what he was trying to do to advocate for himself in the most incredible way. After the time that we spent together, I then reached out to one of my uh, vice presidents and said, we have to do something to help this young man. Um, you know, at the end of the conversation in my office, um, I asked him if I could hug him, and I was in tears. She was kind of shocked at all the things that I was I was dealing with, and um, and she actually ended up connecting me with Jennifer Levesque, who's one of the faculty advisors at the Center for Accessible Learning, and I feel like that was a real changing point. So my name's Jennifer Levesque and we're here at Camosun College on the Lansdowne campus. I work in the Center for Accessible Learning as a faculty member, and I read people's medical documentation when they come to us and approve their accommodations while they're here at the college. On a tour through the building, Jennifer takes us through hallways lined with individual learning spaces, complete with height adjustable desks and computers with the latest in accessible software. So these are the many offices where students come and write their exams, and Shane would have written his exams in these spaces. So the benefits of having offices like this for students coming to write their exams is they can have their extra time, they can have any software that they might be using, as well as the computers um, are available to them. Down another hallway, Jennifer leads us to a row of organized color-coded recycling bins. So here's an example of the bins um, that are across the campus. And when Shane first came, they were in different orders in different places across the campus. And now that we've recognized um, through Shane's advocacy that if we put them in a the consistent order, it makes it accessible to everybody. They'll know which bin to put either their recycling or their compost or their garbage in. With Shane's help, the campus began making changes to become more accessible for all. But soon his focus would shift again. Back at school, his seizures had suddenly returned. Our community will return after the break. We now return to our community. After his first year at Camosun College, Shane Baker's drive to create change was yielding positive results. With all his efforts came unwanted side effects. His seizures had returned, but now Shane had connections. Jennifer helped me arrange a, a seizure first aid seminar. And so I had recently, because I started having seizures again, I connected with uh, Headway Epilepsy Society, which is now part of the BC Ep Epilepsy Society. And um, I was just going to them for support and we decided that it might be a good idea to bring a seizure first aid um, a course to Camosun so that any faculty or instructors or support staff or even any of my classmates um, wanted to learn more about seizures, then they had the opportunity to take this, this course. After we had that uh, workshop, like I probably had all of my instructors, some of the Aitchikala Win staff, which is the Center for Indigenous Education here at the college, some of them took it. And some of my friends, even in my, uh, in my cohort, actually took the course too. One of the things that Jennifer arranged was uh, a visit with the uh, first aid attendant here at the college. Um, just in case um, I ended up having a seizure in class or in the library or, or anywhere on campus. And it was a really great way of just putting myself at ease um, and understanding what I could expect if I was to have a seizure. With his mind at ease, Shane was free to not only continue his studies, but also to use his experience as speaker to bring more positive change onto the Camosun campus. Shane leads us from the indigenous gathering place to the school's library. Inside, he pulls out his cell phone to show the software used for accessible learning. 
One of the things that um, happened when I was at Camosun is they, they incorporated a new system um, called BB Ally. What it did was it helped give you access to alternative uh, formats and documents. Recruitment messages. Begin so basically it's just reading the document to me say. now. Begin paragraph text. Dear students, do accessibility related challenges impact your student life at college? As a student who is visually impaired, I was often not able to access the PDFs that um, instructors would upload for course material. And so um, the BB Ally system gives you the option of, of downloading an alternative format. But the system, far from flawless, was open to human error. And Shane says Sue Donner was instrumental in reducing those problems. My name is Sue Donner, and I am currently standing on the Lansdowne campus of Camosun College, which sits on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wasanich peoples. I am an instructional designer in the e-learning unit here at Camosun College. And my primary role as an instructional designer in e-learning is to help support faculty design, deliver, consider how to engage, deliver content, et cetera, with students online. Sitting at one of the library's computers, Sue shares the issues they encounter and the solutions they found. At the college, we use a platform called Brightspace by a company named D2L to deliver our online courses. Uh, it's a full learning management system, and among other things is the way that faculty can deliver content digitally to their students. One of the big things that we find when faculty upload Word documents or PowerPoints or even create a web page, uh, upload PDFs, is that some of those files have not been designed to meet what we refer to as the web content accessibility guidelines. We frequently have people who will upload um, documents that have images that have no descriptions. They will upload files that have no uh, heading structure, which means that someone like Shane, who might be speed listening to a file uh, and might want to tab through really quickly, he has no structure that he can tab through and he'd have to listen to the whole thing and scroll through the whole thing. So the more we can do, obviously, to make files more accessible, the better experience for Shane would be. What this tool does is for a faculty member, uh, they get this little feedback gauge beside every single item that they have uploaded or added to their content that will tell me uh, if there is something that I should be aware of from an accessibility point of view. What students have is right here beside every file, they have access to an alternate format of that file. There's a refreshable braille option, there's an MP3 option, so that Shane has that choice now. He doesn't have to go to the Center for Accessible Learning and say, could I please have this file in a different format? He has that option right there. Shane says it wasn't long before he and Sue were collaborating on a new project. Sue approached me with an idea and she said she had submitted a proposal to the Ministry of Advanced Education and uh, she included in her budget enough for stu two student researchers. Uh, the project was basically, um, we were going to interact with the students and we would basically find out some of the barriers or challenges that they faced when accessing services at the college. I felt like there was some opportunity to bring in some Indigenous research methods into our project. We uh, had originally thought that we might do something along the lines of a focus group to connect with students. Uh, and Shane, uh, studying in the Indigenous Studies program, Indigenous background, uh, bless him, he was the one who suggested the idea of sharing circles. His focus groups felt like they might be too clinical or too formal a way to really get students to feel that they could trust us with real vulnerable stories. Uh, and so we did, we formulated this as a sharing circle model and then Shane led them, explaining to the students what the format was and, and where the origins of a sharing circle came from. He also shared aspects of his story and his journey with students to help um, set that scene for them. And so in the course of that project, the sharing circles by far generated the most information, the most data for us. So that was all Shane. Our last sharing circle was actually March 11th, 2020. And unfortunately on March 13th, 2020, we were given notice that the college was gonna be closed and we were all fleeing. So as a result, our beautiful project got interrupted just at that moment and has been on pause since then. 
Shane has graduated from Camosun since COVID and is now at UVic. But one of the things I just love about Shane is because he's such a strong self-advocate, he has done an enormous service for other students here at the college who may never meet him, but his impact has been significant. Uh, you'll hear the one thing he said that still just stands out for me is he said, I'm not asking for anything different. I just want the same things that the rest of my classmates have. Shane's impact was officially recognized when he received word that he had been awarded the Lieutenant Governor's Medal for Inclusion, Democracy and Reconciliation. Standing outside Camosun, medal in hand, Shane shared with us the emotions he went through when receiving this honor. Just as I was getting ready to graduate, I, I found out that I was nominated for the uh, um, Lieutenant Governor's uh, Medal Program for um, Democracy, Inclusion and Reconciliation. When I got word about that I won, and started to understand just the scope of it all, it gave me a real opportunity to, um, to think about some of the work I've done and some of the, you know, hopefully make it easier for some students with disabilities at Camosun College to feel a little more included and not always having to self-advocate. Unfortunately, as a result of COVID, all celebrations were canceled, but fortunately, um, the uh, staff at Camosun arranged a, uh, a little bit of a ceremony. It was informal, it was just myself and my partner and, and my family and some of the staff at Camosun who made a real difference. Sherry Bell, the president of Camosun College, remembers the ceremony fondly. The day was spectacular. It was a Victoria day that you just, you know, clear blue sky in the summer. Macaulay Point is gorgeous with the, the ocean and the, the, the rocks and the grass. So we picked a beautiful spot. And um, although we, again, couldn't hug or, or stand close to one another, it was a really beautiful ceremony. And, um, you know, Edith and, and Julius were there, and along with Shane's partner and, and other people that wanted to celebrate, um, and then folks from Camosun. So we were all quite separated, but felt very together because of the, um, the award that he was receiving. Motivated as ever, Shane Baker views the award as a step in the right direction in a lifelong journey of advocacy. I was presented with this uh, medal. Since I, since I won the award, it's given me a lot of gratitude for some of the changes that I've, that I've uh, helped make at Camosun. And it also reminds me of all the people who, who helped support me throughout those times because there was a lot of times where I actually felt like I, I couldn't do it, that this place wasn't for me. And so this award has helped remind me that I need to keep advocating for students like myself and, and, and ensuring that we aren't uh, left out. That day, the day that we had the award, I actually got um, a song sung to me and it was, uh, it was the Buffalo song. And uh, the person who sang it for me said, I'm like the Buffalo and I just run through the storm. And uh, I'm super grateful to them for honoring me like that. And I hope that Camosun College continues to make the changes that they um, are working towards to help, you know, students like myself feel at home here. Producer Mike Waverkan, producer director Sam Graham, writers Jessica Rivers and John Roney, narrator Jim Van Horn, Director of Photography, Luke Connor. Location Audio, Daniel Taggart-Hodge. Editor, John Roney. Sound Mix, David Parfit. Integrated Describe Video Specialist, Ron Rickford. Graphics, Andrew Antonella. Content Development Specialist, Sylvie Fiquette. Coordinating Producer, Jennifer Johnson. Director of Production, Kara Nye. Director of Programming, Brian Perdue. VP Content Development and Programming, John Melville. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2021, Accessible Media, Inc.